Hi, hi everyone. My name is Joseph Rogers. Uh, today's meeting is going to be very informative uh, about some very strong and important issues for us to to think about and not only think about but take action around. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our uh, the person who's uh, and from our organization has put a huge amount of energy and work into organizing this effort. So please give her a big hand to welcome Susan Rogers. Bob Whitaker, or Robert Whitaker, I should say, I'm sorry, is an acclaimed investigative journalist whose books include Anatomy of an Epidemic and Mad in America. Both are inspiring works that paint an accurate and terrifying picture of how individuals with psychiatric diagnoses are treated in this country. He has won numerous awards as a journalist covering medicine and science, including the George Polk Award for Medical Writing and a National Association for Science Writers Award for Best <laughs> Magazine Article. In 1998, he co-wrote a series on psychiatric research for the Boston Globe that was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize for Public Service. An Adam an Epidemic won the 2010 Investigative Reporters and Editors Book Award for Best Investigative Journalism. New Scientist, a British publication, called it an, quote, enthralling and frightening, frighteningly persuasive book, one whose astonishing intellectual punch is delivered with the gripping vitality of a novel. Please welcome Robert Whitaker. It's, it's just great being here. And so what I thought I'd do real quickly is this. We know the APA is meeting, uh, and there's, there's sort of a story that has come out of the APA over the past 30 years in the form of care and a belief in what's possible. And I think a meeting like this is really looking for perhaps a different vision of what's possible. And so I'm just going to sort of real look at how the vision that has emanated from basically the APA over the past 30 years, how that's been playing out. And then we can, the title of this is Imagining a Different Future, I think, of this day. A, a look at maybe what science is telling us about what's possible. What sort of better vision is out there to be claimed and grasped. Um, as you know, I, in some ways, if we look at the modern form of care, we could date it back to 1955, but we could also really date it back to 1980 when we got DSM-3. DSM-3 adopts the medical model uh, and says that basically these are real diseases that are there's sort of a, a, a clearly cut, uh, drawn line. Over here you have a disorder and over here you don't have a disorder. And there's this sort of sense, either have depression or you don't. You have schizophrenia or you don't, or bipolar and you don't. And, and beginning in 1987, of course, Prozac comes to market. This is the first of the second generation psychiatric drugs. And that's when we have really taken off with the use of psychiatric drugs and the expansion of diagnoses and that sort of thing. Just one thing, in 1987, we spent about $800 million in this country on psychiatric drugs. We now spend, oh, oh, well, in 2007, we spent around $40 billion in psychiatric drugs. So that's a 50-fold increase. And so the first question we want to look at is, how is this playing out for us as a society, that medical model? Is it reducing the burden of mental distress for the society as a whole is one question. Are outcomes getting better for people so diagnosed? That's another question, et cetera. And when you try to look at how it's playing out for us as a society as a whole, all the indicators are it's not working for us as a society as a whole. So one a metric you can look at to measure the burden of mental distress in a society is look at the number of people on disability due to a, ment you know, a mental disorder. That's the reason they get declared eligible. Well, in 1987, we had about 1.25 million adults on disability. 2007, we had about 4 million. So it went up threefold during this time of increased use of psychiatric medications and this adoption of the medical model and greater diagnoses. From a societal point of view, that's not a system that's working. In other words, we're spending more money, more people on disability, et cetera. So that's one factor. By the way, that was in 2007. I think we're, we're well over, there's been, so I used the 2007 data. That's the data I got when I was uh, researching anatomy of an epidemic. It's now 2012. I think we're about 800,000 more people since that time. It's an example of how the disability numbers just keep going up and up. How about children? And it's really in this past 20, 25 years, we've really been diagnosing children, medicating children. In 1987, we had 16,200 children on disability due to mental illness. In other words, their family got an SSI payment because of mental illness. Now we have around 700,000 
So that's almost a 40-fold increase. If you look at the kids who go on disability due to, you know, because they have a, this, you know, said to be due to mental illness, about two-thirds go right on to adult disability at age 18, and they sort of have a path as a mental patient, a career as a mental patient laid out for them. I don't think that path did not exist 40 years ago. There just wasn't this well-laid path towards career mental patients. So that's new for kids. Um, I've been doing a lot of talking at schools, the colleges, and I hear over and over again roughly 30% of incoming freshmen now arrive with a diagnosis and a prescription, which just gives you an example of how extensive this paradigm of care has uh, affected our society. How about another question? So that's sort of a big picture. Another question you find when you look at this existing paradigm of care is, where, the question that arises is this, where are all the bipolar patients coming from? <laughs> Forty years ago, which was called manic depressive illness, was a rare disorder. Prevalence rates were about one in 5,000. Okay, so if you do a survey of a, a population, you find that about one in 5,000 would be said to have a bout of manic depressive illness that year. What's the prevalence rate today, 40 years later, for bipolar, quote, bipolar disorder in adults? It's about one in 50. So that's a hundredfold increase in prevalence. So rather than this problem becoming, you know, so where are all the bipolar patients coming from? And so we need to answer that question as well. How about, uh, and we'll get into that real briefly, but how about outcomes? All this would be okay if we were seeing, say, let's say, those diagnosed with manic depressive illness or bipolar were doing better today than they used to be 40 years ago. Do you see outcomes getting better for schizophrenia, depression, bipolar? And we'll go through this, but what you see over and over again, especially with affective disorders, bipolar, uh, uh, depression, these, over the long term, these disorders are running a more chronic course than they used to. You're seeing a lot of change from episodic disorders to chronic disorders. So you don't have that. And then we have the other thing that we all know about is early death. People are dying 15, 25 years earlier than normal. You actually see the pace of early death, this problem accelerating in some data. I was in Southern California recently and the director of the county mental health program who had just uh, done a study on this. He looked at all the county mental health patients, you know, the clients in that service, who had died and not from suicide and not from accident, from a natural cause. The average age of death in that county was 42 among the deaths. So you're seeing we have this extraordinary problem of early death. All those factors just tell us is we need to rethink this paradigm of care. We need to have a more optimistic paradigm of care and a, a paradigm of care that somehow helps really people get back full lives. And I think that's what everybody here believes in essence is possible and, and is worth fighting for. So, next question. Part of the story of uh, the conventional wisdom that has spread through our society in the past 25 years is that um, mental disorders are due to chemical imbalances in the brain, right? We see that in the TVs. And once we believe that, we believe two things. A, that there is, in fact, a very distinct thing, right? If you have a chemical imbalance, you're over here. If you're not, apparently your brain is working fairly okay, at least most of the time. And then the, 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 the logical thing to draw from that is if we do have chemical imbalances, then you do need the meds long term, like insulin for diabetes, right? One follows the other. So the next question we have to ask ourselves, is that story true? And because that is a story that's been promoted, there was a recent survey that said 80% of Americans now know that depression is caused by low serotonin. And the reason we want to ask this question is this, it's really hard to have artful, thoughtful care if it's based on a delusion. You know, you need to have artful care based on sort of a humble evaluation of the science and not a, a story that maybe is serving marketing needs. Anyway, if you look at the chemical imbalance story, it's a, it's a convoluted history, but in short, short order it's this. It arose from an understanding of how the medications act on the brain and not from investigations into people so diagnosed. So for example, they learned that antipsychotics work by blocking dopamine receptors in the brain. In other words, they thwart dopamine activity. And so they hypothesized that the problem in schizophrenia and psychotic disorders is too much dopamine. In other words, the opposite. 
we're more familiar with the low serotonin theory of depression, right? Because we get all, for a long while we had the advertisements, you know, you, you're, you're, you're unhappy, you get your serotonin boost, now you're imbalanced, and now you've got a big smile on your face and you're walking on the beach. Where does that come from? Well, those drugs theoretically up serotonin, right? They, that's what we hear. And so we hypothesize that the drugs, I mean, that the depression is caused by low serotonin. But again, it's a hypothesis born of how drugs act on the brain. Now, I don't have time to go into the research on this, but basically, they began looking in patients in the 1970s to see if people with psychosis slash schizophrenia had overactive dopamine systems as a matter of course, which would mean that basically their presynaptic neurons that secrete the a neurotransmitter had put out too much, or the receiving neurons, which we call the postsynaptic neuron, had too many receptors for dopamine. Either one would be a, a form of hyperactivity. Anyway, long story short is they looked at that and to see, was there a characteristic hyperactivity in patients diagnosed with schizophrenia and psychosis, and they just did not find that to be so. With depression, it was the same thing. They investigated. Do people with depression, prior to being medicated, do they in fact have low serotonin activity? Do their neurons put out too little serotonin? Do they have too few serotonergic receptors? They just did not find that to be so. The low serotonin theory, by the way, fell apart really in the early 1980s. Now they kept on investigating it, but by the early 1980s, the NIMH was saying, it doesn't look like a lesion in the serotonergic system is a primary cause of depression. But I'm just gonna read you a couple things here. Here's a quote from Stephen Stahl, writing in Essential Psychopharmacology in, in the year 2000. Now, this is a, a book that believes in molecular psychiatry, okay? This is a very much a biological book. He writes, There is no clear and convincing evidence that monoamine deficiency, serotonin is monoamine, accounts for depression. That is, there is no real monoamine deficit. Okay, there is no real serotonin deficit. That was in 2000. Here's a quote from Stephen Hyman, former director of the National Institute of Mental Health, in his 2002 book, no Molecular Neuropharmacology. When he's a, he's a neuroscientist at Harvard University, former director of the NIMH, he writes, there is no compelling evidence that a lesion in the dopamine system is a primary cause of schizophrenia. They didn't find it as a sort of characteristic, always present uh, problem. And now here's Kenneth Kendler, co-editor-in-chief of Psychological Medicine in 2005. He summarizes this long search for chemical imbalances, and he writes, we have hunted for big, simple neurochemical explanations for psychiatric disorders, and we have not found them. So what are the implications of these findings? Well, one is this, I'll go back to this. It's hard to practice artful medicine within a society that has been led, become diluted about what we know about the biological causes of mental disorders. Delusion just isn't a good foundation for good medicine, right? That's number one. Number two, what is the responsibility of medical doctors? It's to be honest about what they know and don't know, right? That's a fundamental thing, is to say, if you don't know a cause, say you don't know a cause. Now, just if we say that these chemical imbalances aren't the cause, I'm an agnostic. There, there may be biological factors there to be found, et cetera, and they can then do something. It just means these causes haven't been found. Anyway, this partly tells you also why we need change. We just need um, a form of dialogue, a form of presentation to the public that is based on what really is known in science and not what helps uh, sort of sell drugs. So, and I think that's what we're, what this audience here is also advocating for, is honesty in medicine. And if you have 80% of our public believing in chemical imbalances, something has gone wrong in that dialogue between a medical profession, pharmaceutical industry, and the population. And it's a fundamental wrong, I think. Imagine if you were a heart, cardiac patient. I don't think they would tell you you have a known biological problem with your heart if they didn't think that to be so, or didn't know that to be so. But there's another good message here. Maybe, maybe there isn't, in many cases, anything sort of permanently biologically wrong, okay? And so what we're learning more and more is about stress, trauma, all these social things that can, that can sort of put people into very difficult states.
And what does that mean? What does that conception of, quote, mental illness or psychiatric disorders mean? It means that if you have the wrong things happen to you, you can move into a psychiatric state, whether it be depression or about a mania or about a psychosis, but also means with the right psychosocial care, maybe the right sort of use of medications, you can move back into a place where you don't have that problem. In other words, it can be an episodic problem as opposed to this vision we have out there now of living with a chronic mental illness. You see the difference in visions here? I think, and if we go to this other vision, it's a very hopeful vision, number one. It's a non-stigmatizing vision, number two. Because the vision we have now sort of separates people, right? You're either over here or you're not. This is really a, a, a humanity vision, like, you know, given the, if certain things happen, you can have it real psychiatric tumbles, and with the right care and et cetera, you can repair and heal, that sort of thing. So the next question is, what does science tell us about the course, sort of if we can figure this out, the natural course of mental disorders? So that vision out there that maybe these things can be more episodic, or at least often episodic, does science tell us that is possible? Well, one of the things I did in Anatomy of an Epidemic is try to see what sort of outcomes were we getting before the era, the modern era of psychopharmacology. So <clears throat> I looked at, there was actually a conference in 1956 organized by the NIMH, and they were saying, what sort of outcomes are we getting in first episode schizo schizophrenia cohorts in the past decade before the arrival of Thorazine? Now, our understanding in, in sort of the history of psychiatry as a culture is that prior to 1955, prior to Thorazine, people went into the hospital for schizophrenia and did not get out, right? We said it's Thorazine that made it possible for people so diagnosed to live in the community. What you find is that is not true. So from 1945 to 1955, and again, this is information presented at the very first conference organized by the NIMH on what sort of outcomes are we seeing in the past 10 years? You'll find this with first episode schizophrenia, people with diagnosed with schizophrenia. Roughly uh, two thirds will be discharged in 12 to 18 months. And at three to five years later, of those follow ups of the first cohort, about uh, 65, 70, 75 percent would be living in the community. And this was before the time there were social supports. There was not SSI, there was not SSDI. Employment rates at this time for these first episode cohorts were above 50%. And you know the old adage about schizophrenia, one-third, one-third, one-third? They were really what that comes from is, as far as I can tell, were epidemiological studies that found this five years out. And some of this is coming from England, where they were diagnosing schizophrenia more narrowly in 45 to 55. One-third of the patients five years later just would not be, quote, schizophrenic. They would not be having delusions, hallucinations, etc. They would have had a time of schizophrenia or a time of psychosis. There was another third that, in fact, might still be symptomatic, but they were able to function with those okay out in the environment. Many were able to work, that sort of thing. The people ending up in the hospitals, at least from 1945 to 1955, were that one third part of the initial cohort that weren't getting better. Okay, and that's the group that became sort of on the back wars, et cetera, and seemed to be chronically ill. So what happened, what happened so often is the doctors working in the hospital just saw that chronic population, and they tended to forget about the people who came in and left. But what you see in that story is a lot of episodic illness, okay? Even with psychosis. I'm just gonna read, how about major depression? And this is, with, this is epidemiological studies of people hospitalized for major depression. So they've had a, a severe depressive bout. You look at the long-term course of depression prior to the arrival of antidepressants and it went like this. 50% of those people um, hospitalized for depression would be followed for another 15 years and never be re-hospitalized. Another 30%, their, their depressive episode would, would, would clear up and say eight months, three months, six months, eight months, 10 months. They would recover to what is called euthymia, absence of symptoms. And maybe over the course of 15 years, they might have two or three episodes. It was seen as an episodic disorder, and only about 20% became chronically depressed. And here is what the leading de doctors in depression said in the 19, early 1960s about the natural course of depression. Jonathan Cole, 1964. Depression is, on the whole, one of the psychiatric conditions with the best prognosis for eventual recovery 
with or without treatment. Most depressions are self-limited. Nathan Klein, another expert in depression, 1964. In the the treatment of depression, one always has an ally in the fact that most depressions terminate in spontaneous remissions. This means that in many cases, regardless of what one does, the patient eventually will begin to get better. Dean Schuyler, head of the NIMH depressive section in 1974, he notes that spontaneous recovery rates are so high, exceeding 50% within a few months, that it is, quote, difficult to judge the efficacy of a drug, a treatment, or psychotherapy in depressed patients. Most depressive episodes, he explained, will run their course and terminate with virtually complete recovery without specific intervention. Again, it's seen as an episodic illness with, for most people, a good long time um, course. Manic depressive illness, basically the same story. 50% would be discharged, the mania would clear up or the depression would clear up, and if you follow them out, 50% would never be re-hospitalized in 15, 20 year studies. There'd be another 30% that would have sort of two, three bouts of manic depressive illness in the, in the next 15 years, and only about 20% that would become chronically ill. Employment rates were around 85% at this time, 80, 75, 80%, and no long-term cognitive decline seen in this group. So here is what the expert in the United States in manic depressive illness said about that disorder in 1969. There is no basis to consider that manic depressive psychosis permanently affects those who suffer from it. While some people suffer multiple episodes, each episode is usually, quote, only a few months in duration, quote, and in a significant number of patients, only one episode of illness occurs. He says, after people recover from their episodes, they usually, quote, have no difficulty resuming their usual occupations. And he concludes, and he's talking now about depression and bipolar disorder. Assurance, assurance can be given to a patient and to his family that subsequent episodes of illness after a first mania or a first depression will not tend toward a more chronic course. We have reconceptualized these disorders as chronic disorders. In 1969, they would tell you it's episodic. And if there is one sort of (laughs) phrase that I think we need to rediscover, it's a comment by Samuel Bakova, who was uh, at Boston Psychopathic Hospital. And he writes in the early 1960s, he says, the majority of mental illnesses, especially the most severe, are largely self-limiting in nature if the patient is not subjected to a demeaning experience or to a loss of rights and liberties. That is a vision of extraordinary hope, right? Largely self-limiting in nature. And I think if anything, if we can put out a new vision of that, is to have a form of care that tries to maximize that sense of self-limiting in nature. Now, how about real quickly, what have I got, 10 more minutes? How much? more. Oh, more, okay. 18. 18 minutes. So what can we tell? As you know, we now have a form of care that does emphasize use of medications right away. It generally, uh, you know, there are exceptions to this rule. But as you know, once you go on medications, there often isn't a lot of help getting off the medications. There's often a lot of pressure to take them continually. And the message is basically often you need to take these drugs for life. So what are we seeing with this form of care when we do modern epidemiological studies? Well, if you follow the course with depression, how depression has changed in the, in the modern era, it goes like this, this sort of um, two-minute story. They introduced antidepressants in the 70s and sort of larger scale use, and, or 60s, then early in the 70s. You hear doctors right away say this, well, my patients are maybe getting better faster but they're relapsing into depression more frequently now. So at the very beginning thing, you see this worry that depression is actually, as one doctor said, we're we're making it tend towards a more chronic course. So you see the worry show up right away. Next thing you do see, all of a sudden, relapse rates for drug-exposed patients are higher than than it used to be. People are going back to the hospital more frequently, et cetera. As early as 1985, the NIMH actually convenes a, a, um, a conference on the course of mental disorders, uh, uh, affective disorders, and they say something like this. We used to think these ran a benign course, now we're seeing a much more chronic course, what's going on? And what they said is, all those old studies must be flawed, and now we're discovering the true course of depression. But obviously what they're seeing now is the true course of medicated depression. 
and where people are going on, going off, that sort of thing. Let's see if I have a phrase on here. Just to sum this up, this is from the APA's textbook of psychiatry, 1999, and you can see the change in the course in this quote. It used to be thought that, quote, most patients would eventually recover from a major, major depressive episode. However, more extensive studies have disproved this assumption. It is now known, the APA says, that, quote, depression is a highly recurrent and pernicious disorder. Do you see what that you see in that phrase? They're, they're acknowledging this change in what was understood to be the course of depression. We've had one recent study called the STAR-D study that was funded by the NIMH. It's the largest antidepressant trial ever conducted, 4,041 patients. Now, the announced news was that 67% of patients in that study, after multiple tries with an antidepressant, remitted. Nothing like that actually happened. That study, there's a whistleblower lawsuit on that. If you actually dig into the data, that is, a, is the only way to put it, is basically a fraudulent study. There were people entered into the study who really didn't qualify. Uh, they changed endpoints. The 67% was actually a mathematical calculation. It's not actually what happened. But here's the most important data from the STAR-D study. There was a, I think it was either a 12-month or an 18-month follow-up. A 12-month follow-up was what it was. So they took those people who had remitted at some point in the initial study, they put them in a, a follow-up, and they did all sorts of stuff to help those people stay well. At the end of one year, out of the 4,041 patients who entered the STAR-D trial, there were 108 who had remitted and stayed well and in the trial at the end of one year. That's about a 3% documented stay well rate. That's the worst stay well rate I have seen in any literature anywhere. Now, there were some dropouts. We don't know what happened to the dropouts. But in terms of a documented stay well rate, not there. Anyway, that's, that's an example of what happened in depression. Now I'm going to just read, since time is short, three quotes about the change in the course of bipolar disorder between before and today. Here's a quote from Fred Goodwin. Fred Goodwin was a former director of the NIMH. Uh, he's written sort of a couple textbooks on manic depressive illness. He's seen as a foremost expert. He says in 2008, the illness has been altered. Today, we have a lot more rapid cycling than we described in the first edition. First edition, I think, was in 1978. A lot more mixed states than we described in the first edition. A lot more lithium resistance. And a lot more lithium treatment failure than there was in the first edition. The illness is not what Kreplin described anymore. Kreplin was the great uh, German psychiatrist who laid out the course of, of manic depressive disorders. So what is Fred Goodwin saying? Did you hear that? It runs a more symptomatic course today. Now, he, why he's not blaming the meds, although he does suggest that the antidepressants are the cause. But you can see that is not a story of long-term outcomes improving. Here's a second quote. This is from Carlos Serrate and Mauricio Towin. Carlos Serrate, at least when he wrote this, uh, this paper in 2000, was head of the, at some point was head of the mood disorders program at the NIMH. So this is one of our experts. He says, in the era prior to pharmacotherapy, poor outcome in mania was considered a relatively rare occurrence. However, modern outcome studies have found that a majority of bipolar patients evidence high rates of functional impairment. Did you hear that? Poor outcome used to be rare, now we're seeing it with all the time. Here's a, here's a, a comment by Ross Baldessarini. I think this was a 2007 paper. He's a famous uh, researcher at Harvard <coughs> Medical School. He says, prognosis for bipolar disorder was once considered relatively favorable. But contemporary findings suggest that disability and poor outcomes are prevalent despite major therapeutic advances. So he's saying we have these therapeutic advances and yet the outcome is shifting for the worse. You'd think that maybe we need to understand in a time of therapeutic advances why outcomes are shifting for the worse. You actually see long term, at least with some, that bipolar outcomes over the long term are beginning to merge with medicated schizophrenia outcomes. You're seeing a lot of uh, sort of functional you know, poor employment. You are seeing cognitive decline in, in some bipolar patients that didn't used to be seen. And you're seeing a lot of physical ailments related to the drug cocktails. So you are seeing, in my opinion, a shift down in the long-term course. So finally, how about schizophrenia? If there's anything that we should know, it's that schizophrenia, antipsychotics improve the long-term course of schizophrenia. Our society says that it's really a form of bad care not to people, put people on antipsychotics right away. 
and there is very little support in the society as a whole and among the profession as a whole for withdrawing people from those medications. I get emails every day from someone saying, where can I go to try to withdraw from my, or taper off my antipsychotics? And there are very few psychiatrists out there that will, that, there are very few programs that will support that. I'll give you two studies, three studies, I think, that we need to know about and incorporate into our understanding of long-term course of schizophrenia and psychosis. One of the studies by the World Health Organization. They've done two studies, they did two studies in the 1970s and the 1980s that compared outcomes in three poor countries, India, Colombia, and Nigeria, with outcomes in the U.S. and six other rich countries. One was a two-year study, one was a five-year study. Each time they found that outcomes in those studies were better in the poor countries of the world, specifically India and Nigeria. And the WHO investigators at that time concluded that living in a developed country is, quote, a strong predictor that you won't do particularly well over the long term. So living in a developed country is a strong predictor of a relatively poor outcome. After the first such study, they hypothesized maybe one of the reasons for the better outcomes in the poor countries is the patients are more medication compliant. So they looked at medication usage in the second study and they found that in the poor countries only 16% of the patients were regularly maintained on antipsychotics. This is not necessarily saying what the drugs are doing or not doing, but it opens up a different possibility, right? That in countries where not everybody is maintained on drugs long term, you're actually seeing better outcomes with some sort of selective use of drugs. By the way, they, they did a 25-year follow-up of those patients in that study, and in the poor countries, if I have this, Hopefully I have this. In the poor countries, 25 years later, 53% were never psychotic anymore. Okay, and that's a group diagnosed with schizophrenia. And 73% were employed. It's a sign of very good long-term outcomes. We have another study. It was done by Courtney Harding at the um, Boston University when she was did this. She followed a group of patients released from the back wards of Vermont State Hospital in the late 1950s, early 1960s. Now this was the chronic group. Remember we said one-third, one-third, one-third? This is the one-third chronic group. The group that is not ever expected to get better. Now they got a lot of psychosocial care. What did she find 20 years later? She found that one-third of that chronic group was completely recovered. Asymptomatic having pretty good social lives, a lot of employment, and off meds in, in her definition. So you can see in that that we at least need a form of care that allows for the possibility that some people will do better off meds. Now finally we have a modern study that really I think is challenging if we were to go over to the APA and if we were to really look at the outcomes of this long-running prospective study on first episode psychosis, first episode, well, not her, psychosis and schizophrenia, we really need to look at this as a society. It's a study done by Martin Harrow, who's a researcher at the University of Illinois College of Medicine. Beginning in the late 1970s, early 1980s, he began um, following 200 patients, diagnosed either with uh, a mild or psychotic disorder or schizophrenia, at two Chicago area hospitals, one private, one public, and he just follows them. Everyone's treated with drugs, okay? And then they're discharged, and he follows them at two, four and a half, seven and a half, ten, fifteen, and twenty years. What does he find, real quickly? At the end of two years, and then he just sees if they're taking meds, okay? And it's a naturalistic study. People can stay on the meds or they can go off. The purpose of the study, if you read the abstract, was to figure out what happens to people who go off their meds. The understanding, of course, is that as a, a matter of course, they end up like homeless in jail, doing terrible, right? Well, of the 64 schizophrenia patients that he managed to follow throughout the 15 years, 25 basically got off their antipsychotics by year two. And at year two, they were doing slightly better than the on-med group, okay? But then there's something that shows up in that data that we don't see anywhere else in the scientific literature. And that is the group off meds on the whole got a lot better over the next two and a half years. Whereas those on meds did not. You see them just sort of stabilizing. Such that by the end of four and a half years, 40% of those off meds with a schizophrenia diagnosis were in recovery versus 5% or 6% of those on meds, an eightfold higher recovery rate. It was that difference in recovery rate at the end of 15 years as well 40% versus 5%. Employment rates for the off med group were above 50%. Okay, you saw a lot of employment. You see a lot of healing there. 
The model psychotic disorders group was 81 patients, same thing. At the end of two years, there wasn't that much difference. But then what you see between year two and year four and a half, a lot of improvement in the off-med group. A lot of healing going on. Such that by the end of four and a half, as a group, the off-med group with the other psychotic disorders really was mania with psychotic features, depression with psychotic features, and schizoaffective. As a group, they were very close to a recovered group. They had really good outcomes, good employment, etc. as a group, and it stayed like that. And all I can say is you can see in that Harrow data for that milder disorders group, a lot of healing that goes on. But see the time frame it takes? Two years, three years, four years, five years. We don't have a system built to provide care over that longer period of time. And I think the Herald data is telling us loud and clear that there's a lot of recovery possible. And I mean robust recovery, full-fledged recovery, if we give time. And it's just a, a signal to us about what we need to do. Anyway, you should read, Harold just came out with his 20-year data. Um, and it is pronounced, I'll just give you one, in the 20-year data, better cognitive functioning in the off-med group. Less anxiety, less um, psychotic symptoms, much more recovery. In fact, he also does this comparison. And by the way, this is not medical advice. You know, no one should take this as medical advice. And you know, I think there's a place for the meds, etc. But it's just what I'm saying is we need to know this information too. He compared a group of patients that got off meds by a year or two and stayed off throughout the next 18 years. And he compared that to a group of patients who were medication compliant throughout the 20 years. Among the group that was medication compliant, only 17% ever entered a period of recovery. That's when recovery was defined as working too. Okay, they, 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 were, they might be stable, but to be in recovery in Harrow study, you had to be working half time. So 17%. Of those who got off by year two and stayed off, 87% had two or more sustained periods of recovery. That is really good. Now, maybe there's some self-selection going on. Who knows? But the problem is, if we go over to the APA meeting, you, I don't think you're going to be hearing, at least in the past, of the possibility of sustained periods of recovery off meds with an initial diagnosis of schizophrenia or psychosis. And what we really need is to embrace a vision of care, I think, and I think this is why we're all here, that is much more optimistic and is much more less stigmatizing and really offers this hope and this possibility. You have a time, you have some psychiatric distress, but we need a system that maximizes where people get back their really full, robust, involved, meaningful lives. And I think science is telling us is this is very possible. Have I got one minute left? Yes, oh, you have. Please. One minute left? <laughs> I just want to say, one of the nice things is, if we we'll say we're first episode psychosis, there is a group in northern Finland that did reconceive of what was possible. Beginning in 1992, they developed a form of care called open dialogue therapy. It really emphasizes, right at the beginning, a lot of psychosocial care. That's one. Two, they reconceived of what psychosis is. The psychosis does not reside in the brain of the person identified as, you know, who's having psychotic symptoms. They say psychosis exists in the in-between spaces of people, and the person who is psychotic or having these symptoms bears the burden of making manifest, making known this disruption in the social web. Now, if you have that social conception, what do you need to do as a society? Do we need to fix your brain? We need to fix the social web. And there's a lot of emphasis on breaking the so fixing that social web, breaking isolation, bringing the person back into school, uh, jobs, relationships, all the things I think we all need to stay well. And what are their outcomes now? They now have the best outcomes in the Western world for first episode psychosis. At the end of five years, 80% of their first episode patients are working or back in school. Only 20% are on disability. And in terms of antipsychotic use, it goes like this. They try to avoid initial use of the antipsychotics. They use benzos to restore sleep wake. <clears throat> if someone's not getting better after three, four weeks, they will use antipsychotics. And then even after they use them, they try to use them for a short period of time rather than forever. At the end of five years, only one-third of their patients have ever been exposed to antipsychotics. Only 20% are taking them on a regular basis. So they have found a model of care, a selective model of care, that tries to figure out for whom do the medications benefit and for how long.
It's a very subtle use, quite different from one size fits all, take your drug, you got the diagnosis, and be on it for life. They have embraced this nuanced selective use model and they do have now the best outcomes in the Western world. And the other thing that's happening in Western Finland, in Western Lapland, which is the northern part of Finland, is schizophrenia is, is sort of disappearing from that region. The eruption of psycho... They, it, this is a population of about 70,000. Before they adopted this model of care, they were getting about 27 new cases of schizophrenia per year. If you do your prevalence numbers, that's a lot of new cases per year, okay? They're now down to about two or three. A 90% reduction in this, what we say is the worst mental illness. But the eruption of psychosis has not declined so much in their society. It's basically stayed the same. It's been a little decline. So what's happening? Psychosis is appearing at the same frequency, but schizophrenia, they have like a 90% decrease. The, the reason is people aren't remaining psychotic long enough to move to the schizophrenia diagnosis. With the DSM, it's like you have to be psychotic. For, symptoms have to be around for six months or more. They're breaking that. They're turning it into a shorter episodic disorder. Anyway, Finland is, Western Lapland Finland is different, but it tells you about what is possible. And that's, I think, really why you're all, why we're all gathered here together today, is to try to get a new vision out there that uh, will replace this sort of pessimistic, chronic vision that we've been living with for the past 25 years and really have a vision of turning these disorders as much as possible back into episodic problems and sort of minimizing the, 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 the frequency with which they become more chronic, etc. So, thank you.